Issues of free speech in a diverse society were the main focus of this year's Posse Plus retreat. Posse is a scholarship that seeks to promote diversity and leadership. Our own Posse scholar, Talking Points correspondent Elijah Shama, was at the retreat. Elijah interviewed his faculty guest professor, Sharice Lepre, in the studio to see where she stands on these issues. One of the main arguments for the limitation of free speech. Ro what role do you think hate speech plays in the dialogue that's occurring today, and should it be allowed to remain? So for the most part, hate speech focuses on ascribed groups, groups to which you have no control over whether or not you belong. I think hate speech is also further complicated by the idea of uh, intention versus impact. That the words we say, we may even intend for them to hurt a specific group. We could talk about you know, dog whistle politics and coded language. So you might intend to hurt a group, but if it's not overtly hurtful, if it's not overtly hateful, then it doesn't count as hate speech. So I think the phrase, I think the phrase itself, hate speech, is inherently problematic. There is a legal definition, but there's also a colloquial definition. And it's very quick. I think people are very quick to focus on the colloquial definition. And sometimes, honestly, the colloquial definition can be a better definition than the legal definition. Because I see it over and over. The question is whether or not this person committed a hate crime. And the only indication we have of a hate crime is whether or not they used hate speech. That seems inherently problematic to me when hate speech is categorized as certain speech. All right, I'd like to circle back to that idea of intention because mm -hmm. many people often offend people unintentionally. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the role of intent when using language and how should someone wanting to learn more about these often controversial terms approach a conversation so as not to offend a party? So two things. One, I question whether or not we should be fearful of offending people. And I say this explicitly because we learn through those conversations. So if we're afraid of offending people, which is kind of the politically correct argument, the discourse right now, big air quotes around it, because I don't like that definition of politically correct, but let's move on. Um, because people are afraid to offend people. I think that the more valuable conversation is why is it offensive? What can I learn about your history or your experience to let me know that that was offensive? Absolutely, I have said offensive speech before, perhaps without intention. And somebody then checked me and said, well, that's hurtful because this, this, and this. And we all learn a little bit more. I learn a little bit more about the person who is offended. The person who is offended learns a little bit more about me. And I come up with better words to describe what I was thinking, especially if that was not my intention. So I don't think we should be afraid of offending people. By that same token, I don't think that we should you know, scream off with their heads when somebody yeah. says something offensive. But rather, why is that offensive? What does that tap into your history that I am unaware of so that I can learn more about it, so that I can choose my words carefully, so that I can be a cognizant adult that can express themselves appropriately given a massive history that, are may, that I may or may not be aware of. All right. Our last question. During the Posse Plus retreat, scholars were encouraged to bring the conversations back to campus. How do you feel Syracuse deals with the issue of diverse speech on campus? And what do you feel can be done to foster a more inclusive campus environment, especially for minority students? Mm -hmm. uh, two things. One, I question exactly how much Syracuse University as an institution can do. Because you know, at Newhouse, we have a requirement, a diversity requirement, where students are required to take my class, which is fine. We could institute a diversity requirement across all the departments and all the schools. Um, Having said that, most of the conversations that end up happening are opt-in conversations, otherwise known as preaching to the choir. So the institute can have a talk-back session, but the people who go are the people who want to talk back, the people who are affected by this. The people who are not affected don't have to go. So the only way to get them to do something is to have a requirement. So for me, I think that the institution can foster conversations, um, but it can't necessarily demand them. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Back to you, Alex.